problem. This is a specific kind of problem that's used from that so we all see it that way. And it's not a true isolable country way. I think it's easy to solve it. And there's other ways to solve it. And so you just kind of have to know that you can see No problem. All right. Okay, let's do a little demo. Okay, what's happening here? I've got two uh, shallow dishes here, and one will put a little acetic acid, and one a little more. There we go. And the other one will put what have we got here? Two normal uh, HDL. Okay, that's cool. And then I've got some universal indicator just for fun. Okay. Okay. And then uh, I got some chalk. I don't know why I brought chalk. There's a lot of chalk in this room, but whatever. Okay. Here we go. And I'm going to put that in there. Okay. There. Wait, which one was this one? This was the CC acid, right? Yeah. Okay. So, chalk, uh, you can see it's reacting, obviously. It's calcium carbonate. And it's forming carbonic acid uh, in here. I'll show you the reaction in a little bit. I think I have it. Uh, and so, carbonic acid. Acid automatically goes to CO2 and water, so that's what the bubbles are giving CO2. Out. Okay, now that's a weak acid, right? Okay. You can see the difference with a strong acid just goes crazy. Uh, relative to it, there's a lot of CO2 being given off uh, in here, uh, just much faster. Uh, and just, I guess I'll show you like this. Yeah, that works. Here's the demo. Just hold it above it for a second. The calcium carbonate with HCl or the acetic acid goes to the CO2 plus water. That's uh, the carbonic acid plus the salt. So you can see the stronger acid is just more reactive. It doesn't mean the weaker acid is not reactive. Uh, it's just a little bit stronger. The weaker acid is actually forming a buffer right now, uh, and uh, that'll lead me kind of to our next one. Let's add a little, I've got a little empty container here, I guess so other people can see too, empty container. I'm going to fill this up with some acetic acid. Okay. And then, got some acetic acid in there. We'll see how this works. If I don't like the acetic acid, I'll put something else in there. Uh, and then, of course, I've got a cork. That's my initial. Okay. Uh, and where is that? The same thing. CO2 will be given off. I'm going to toss some chalk in there. And then. I'm just going to cap it so you can see if you want to see in here. It's just capped. And we'll see if that gives off enough bubbles. If it doesn't, forget it. We'll add that strong acid. But hopefully, that'll give off enough that that cork will eventually, when enough CO2 is given off, it pop. We'll see. Okay, let's go back to buffers now. Of course. Buffers. Uh, I want to say one more thing about buffers before we do an example problem. Let's say an example buffer would be HA and A minus. That would be an acid and its conjugate base. Uh, if you try to change the pH of a buffer, let's say you add a base to the buffer, then what's going to happen is the acid of the buffer will neutralize that base. 
But let's say you add an acid to the buffer, then the conjugate base will neutralize. So it doesn't matter what you're adding to the buffer because there's two components. The buffer is going to try to neutralize that thing, whatever that entity is that you add. Uh, so let's give this away. Oh, One more thing I want to show you before we do an awesome uh, example. Okay, uh, I have to teach you one new concept before we do a buffer example. It's going to be called the stoichiometry concept or stoichiometry problem. Uh, and you can see that YouTube video if you want. Stoichiometry concept or stoichiometry problem. Here's the deal. Uh, I'll write this out. There, here's the concept. There must be uh, a zero, zero on the unfavored side. Okay? This is uh, not, it's not a new concept. It's actually true before, but it comes up a lot when you do a buffer problem. When you're doing a buffer problem, there must be a zero on the unfavored side. Uh, if not, you have to do what's called a stoichiometry problem. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Let's say we had A plus B goes to C, and K is equal to 10 to the 10. Okay? So we have that, and let's say we have, uh, let's balance it, let's put a 3 there. No, that's too hard. Let's do it out. Let's say we have one mole of this and two moles of this, and zero of this. You might be tempted to go, hey, I want to solve for the equilibrium values. I'm going to go straight to the ice table right now. The problem is, you can't quite do that yet. Uh, this reaction really wants to go forward. What's the favored side here, right or left? The right is favored because k is so large. Remember, if k is large, bigger than 1, products are favored, if K is small, less than one, the reactants are favored. And this is explained also in my reader on page 81. The textbook just calls it a stoichiometry problem, so if you see it in the textbook, that's what they call it. And it starts to get into it about page 702. Okay, so what, here's what you need to do when the, you uh, encounter this issue. You're going to say, well, uh, this one mole of A is going to react the way one mole of B. Basically, uh, A is the limiting reactive, B is in excess here, so that uh, you're going to have zero of this and one of this left when the reaction goes forward. And then what's going to happen over here on C? You're going to add one mole. So you lost a mole here, you react, uh, produce a mole here, you have one mole of that. Now, this is now your eye line of the ice table. This is your eye line. Now you can start the ice table. So this previous part here was called a stoichiometry geometry problem, using this concept that if K is large, you have to move the reaction forward. So basically, you need a zero on the unfavored side. See how there's a zero now on the unfavored side? There must be a zero on the unfavored side. Now you can start the ice table. If there's not a zero on the unfavored side, you must do a stoichiometry problem first. Okay. Any questions on that? That's a concept. You're going to see it momentarily. Okay. Well, maybe right now. Let's do this. Write this down first, and then I'll explain what the heck this problem means. Okay. So write it down first. In a moment, I'll explain basically what the problem means and why I'm asking it.
calculate the change of pH for the 0.01 molar of sodium hydroxide you added to one liter of buffer solution from the previous problem. Compare your answer to the same addition of one liter of water. This is a pretty typical, what we call buffer problem. Uh, just so you can see this, this is uh, a subsequent part of the previous problem. So we just did this one up here. Uh, you could have just read the words. It says buffer solution. We actually just did a buffer problem previously. Buffer problems and common ion problems are pretty related. Uh, we had acetic acid and sodium acetate. Acetic acid is the acid, sodium acetate is the conjugate base. So we had acid and conjugate base, they're both weak, they are about the same molarity, these are, that was a really good buffer. Okay? So in this problem, here we've created the buffer. In this second problem, we're going to try to mess around with the buffer. We're messing with the buffer by adding sodium hydroxide. Do you expect the pH to go up or down? If we add this. Up, it's a base. So we expect it to go up. Do we expect it to go up a lot or a little? Well, if this is a buffer, it resists pH change, so it should go up very little. Is that okay? So I have a buffer, it resists pH change. I'm adding bases or acids to it, whatever. The pH is going to change, but very, very little. Is that kind of okay? So I'm expecting, remember the answer? What was the answer to this one? 4.74. So the answer should be greater than 4.74, but not that much greater. Okay? That's what we're expecting. Again, I'm adding sodium hydroxide to a buffer. It's increasing the pH, uh, but hopefully not very much if we have a good buffer, and we do. Okay, so let's start off this problem uh, the same way as before. Well, kind of the same way as before. Uh, we have acetic acid. Well, let me just write out what we all have in solution. We have sodium acetate. That's the buffer from the previous problem. And we have sodium hydroxide. Okay? We have all those. What do I think about the sodiums? They're spectators. They're garbage. Garbage. They're neutral. Spectator ions, they're not helpful. So I'm going to totally ignore them. And I'm going to pay attention to only the acetate ion and the sodium hydroxide. Okay, is the sodium hydroxide preferred to react with the acetate ion or acetic acid? The first one or the second one? Yeah, uh, this is not going to happen for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is a base and that's a base. A base would rather react with the acid. Second of all, and so this acid of the buffer is going to try to neutralize this base. Second, this has a minus and that has a minus. It's not too often the two minuses will react together. So the, if you add a base to a buffer, the acid part of the buffer will react with it. All right, so the reaction is going to look like this. I'm reacting. The buffer is trying to neutralize this base that was just added. I'm going to use the acidic part of the buffer. Now, I'm going to tell you, this reaction will go up forward 100%. Why is that true? Because I have a strong base that's totally white. You got it. Because whenever you have a strong acid or a strong base in the reactant, it's going to force the reaction forward 100%. Remember, strong acid and strong base is fully react. The same concept from the previous chapter. Forces the reaction forward 100%. That's true for a strong acid or strong base here. Okay, so I add that. This is going to form. Better be able to write my acid base equation here. It's not one of my general reactions, just a normal acid base reaction. There we go. So that acid loses a proton, the base gains a proton. Okay, again, it goes forward 100%. Let's write in our numbers. This from the previous problem, 0 0.50. This from this problem, 0 0.010. And this from this problem, 0 0.50. Now let's. Oh, wait, this is from the previous problem. This 0.1 mol molar was added in this. Now let's get our units straight. This is molarity, this is molarity, and this is moles. 
Okay. Couple things. First, I'm going to work on my units in a second. Okay, we'll hold on to the units for just a moment. First of all, is the right side or the left side unfaded? Which side is unfaded? The left. How did you know that? Because it goes 100% to the right. The right side must be favored. K must be huge for this reaction. Okay, do you notice I don't have a zero on the unfavored side? I have to react it forward. Uh, but before I do that, the second, first thing you realize that, <laughs> the second is let's fix the units. Um, whenever you do stoichiometry, just like in 2A, I fully always recommend that you use moles. Just like you can in 2A. Use moles whenever you do stoichiometry. So I'm going to change that molarity to moles. I do that by multiplying by the volume. What's the volume in this problem? Oh, it's just one liter. So there we go. It's the same because it's just one liter multiplied by a liter to get moles. Okay, so moles for stoichiometry, molarity for ice table. That's going to be our rule from here on out. Moles for stoichiometry, molarity for ice tables. All right, so I'm going to react this away. Do you see this is going to be my limiting reactant? There's less of it. That's my limiting reactant. So I'm going to subtract this amount from the reactant because it's totally going to react away. And then I'm going to add that to the product. See what I get? 0 0.49 here, 0, 0 0.51. All in moles right now. Okay, am I cool now with my concept? I am because I have a zero on the unfavored side. That zero under the hydroxide. That zero right here. So it's cool now. I can now do an ice table. So I had to do stoichiometry first before I could start the ice table. That is really normal in a buffer problem. The stoichiometry part was everything above this line. This is now the eye line of the ice table. Uh, but let me rewrite a little bit first. Uh, let me move this. But this is essentially going to be the eye line. Uh, oh, I don't like that scribble there. Okay. I'll rewrite down here. Okay. I'm going to try to rewrite this reaction, but watch out what happens here. As I start to rewrite this reaction, I notice what happened to my sodium hydroxide. It's all reacted away. You see that? There's no more sodium hydroxide left. It's all gone. So now, all I have left is water. Now the reaction looks different. Again, this is going to be really normal. The stoichiometry reaction will often, especially in this chapter, be, this, be different than the equilibrium reaction. Why? Because whatever I add to a buffer is going to be totally gone. And when it's totally gone, all that's left uh, for this reaction with is water. And so now in my uh, I line here, this is 0 0.49. This is 0 0.51. Water I ignore, and this is 0. So it kind of looks like a common ion problem at this point forward. Let's check our units. This is in moles from up here. Remember moles. But again, it said I have one liter, right? So if I divide that by liters, this is now just molarity. I purposely picked uh, a volume of one liter, so we don't have to mess with uh, molarity and moles changing around. Later, as we get to more difficult problems, uh, the moles and the molarity will be a little different. Okay, this reaction shifts which way, right or left? Towards the zero, to the right. By the way, is this zero on the unfavored side? Okay, which side is the unfavored side, right or left? Okay.
okay, what is this? First, let's go backwards. We're rewinding. Is this a strong or a weak acid? Weak. So does it go forward? It doesn't actually. A weak acid doesn't go forward, so the favored side is actually this side, the left side. Okay, K is really, really small for weak acids. So do I have a zero on the unfavored side? Yes, I do. So I can go through the ice table now. Because I did all this mess up here, it caused me to get a zero over here where I need it, and I can go through with the ice table. This is going to be minus x plus x plus x. 0 0.49 minus x, 0 0.51 plus x, and x. There's my ice table. And I know, first time seeing buffers is pretty crazy. Uh, so K, A, from the previous problem, remember it was super small. 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. That's why the reactants are favored and the products are unfavored. This is going to be, just like the previous problem, we just have different numbers here from the E line. Products over reactants. What am I going to do next? Assume. Yeah. Assume that x is a lot, lot less than both 0.51 and 0.49. Uh, how do I know that's true? Because if I look at either of these concentrations, they're more than 100 times actually 100,000 times larger than this number. Is that all right? Okay. So, uh, this causes us to get Ka equals 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 equals, so now both these x's will drop out. That's 0 0.51 over 0 0.49 times x. Fairly easy to solve. At this point, this little cross multiplication, x is going to equal. What did I get for x? 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5 is what I got. So, what is this equal to? Which concentration from the ice table? Yeah, if you go back to the ice table, x is H3O plus. That's why I'm going to take the negative log of this right now. Find pH, what I wanted in the first place. Four point seven six. Okay, first, any questions on the math before I explain the problem? Way up there, yeah. Uh, why did I have the hydronium ion where? Oh, why does it go from water to hydronium in the ice table? That's a general reaction for an acid. So the acid plus water goes to acetate ion plus hydronium. That acid, uh, let's see, in the previous part, this acid donated the proton to water. So that's the gain it right there. Any other questions on this? Okay, let me explain this now. First of all, what was the answer to the previous problem? 4.74. Is this a good buffer? It's awesome. Yeah. It, it, the pH barely changed. It resisted a pH change. So the pH just went slightly up because we added a base, but not very much at all. Um, what did we do in this problem? Just as a slight review now, we realized what we had. We had a base, so it has to react with the acid. We wrote that out. Whenever you have a strong base, the reaction is going to go forward 100%. So this is the unfavored side here on the left. I need a zero on the unfavored side because it wants to go to the right. So I had to go through this stoichiometry first. I want to make sure I'm in moles. In this problem, it wasn't a big deal because I had one liter, but it will be a big deal later. Uh, then, once I have this, this is essentially going to become my eye line. I do need to slightly rewrite the, the reaction, though, because now there's no hydroxide. So now it's just acid plus water, no hydroxide. And this has now become 
the general reaction for an acid. I go through the ice table. I have a number here and a number here from the previous part, from the stoichiometry, and a zero for hydronium. And now I just solve it as normal, uh, as the Sami do. And we're expecting a slightly larger answer from the previous part. Uh, just for fun, uh, the second part of the question was, do the same for pure water. Uh, so if we had one liter of water, water, remember, is not a buffer. And if I add to this 0 0.010 moles of NaOH, what I'm expecting for pure water is now the pH is going to jump like crazy because water is not a good buffer. So in water, we expect a very different result than 4.76. Well, let's try this. Um, if I divide by the 1.0 liter, the concentration of sodium hydroxide, now it's a strong base, is 0 0.010 molar. And because it's a strong base, I don't need the ice table. I know this is automatically equal to the hydroxide concentration. Remember, strong bases and strong acids do not need the ice table. Uh, so I know that concentration. Uh, I can find the H3O plus concentration because I know this formula from the ion product of water. Or the H3O plus concentration equals Kw over the hydroxide concentration. Kw is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And the hydroxide concentration is 0 0.010 mole. Just doing this little simple math here. I get 1.0 times 10 to the minus 12 for the hydro uh, hydronium minus concentration. pH is negative log H3O plus. The pH here is 12.00. You see with water, oh, let's push this up a little bit. With water, the pH just jumps like crazy up whenever you add a base. With the buffer, it went from 4.74 just up to 4.76. Here, the pH initially with water would have been 7, neutral. It went all the way up to 12. So big change when there's no buffer. Okay, now, if your life isn't horrible enough, uh, I'll try to make it slightly easier. Earlier, we're going to rewind back in time like they do in the movies sometimes. We have this equation. Yeah, earlier we had this equation, which was from this. Uh, well, I'll just use arrows here. This was the concentration of the acetate ion, and that 0.49 was the concentration of the acetic acid. What people do in uh, the der full derivation is on page 705 of the text or page really kind of get 81, 82 of the reader. You can kind of manipulate this for x, and I'm not going to do the derivation, but you can if you want. You can see it in the text, dot, dot, dot. You can actually derive a simpler equation for solving for this, where if you know the concentration of the acid, and the conjugate base, you can come up with what's called the Henderson Hasselbach equation. Henderson Hasselbach equation. It looks like this. You can Find the pH using this simple equation, and you can skip the ice table. Okay, using this, you can skip the ice table if it's a buffer. 
There are built-in assumptions with this, assuming x is small, which is a good assumption with uh, buffers. And if we rewind a little bit, uh, if you go back in your notes just a little bit when we were doing the previous problem, I could have skipped all this, all that ice table, I, and I could have skipped uh, all this. And I could have just got 4.76 using the equation. Uh, let me just plug in so you see how that would work. So I could have skipped all that math if I wanted to. So hopefully that makes your life slightly less horrible than it is already. If I would have done this, I would have said pH is pK, that's negative log of Ka, plus the log of the base over the acid. The negative log of Ka was 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, plus the log of the base. The base in this case was 0.51 molar, and the acid was 0.49 molar. You plug this in, you're going to get 4.76. So I could have skipped all that ice table, I could have skipped all that math, and just done this if I wanted to. The henderson ossobach equation, which I'll give you, is a pretty helpful equation uh, whenever you're working with buffers. Oh, I'm not quite done. Any questions on that so far? Okay. I need to give you three terms and we'll finish this section. Return. Buffer capacity, buffer range, and then, uh, yeah, those two are good. Buff two terms, actually. This will be good. Buffer capacity, you want to know these terms. The buffer capacity is the amount of acid or base uh, that you can add to a buffer before the buffer doesn't work anymore. So before uh, you have any significant pH changes, this is the amount of acid or base that you can add to a buffer and it can be neutralized before significant pH changes occur or before you destroy the buffer, before the buffer doesn't really work anymore. The buffer range, oh, and, and this is, well, that's okay. The buffer range is a pretty similar uh, kind of definition, but uh, it's related more to the pH. The buffer range of a is plus or minus one of the pKa. So if you go above or below the pKa of the buffer by one unit, uh, you're going to exceed the buffer range of, of that buffer. So causing it to go above or below one unit, that'll exceed the buffer range of the buffer. All right. I think that's a good place to stop. Next time we'll do a practice problem and go straight to titration.